This video is part two to a two-part series of the history of Egypt, since the history of Egypt is, like, long. If you haven't seen it yet, go watch it. Do it now! When we last left off, Cleopatra VII famously committed suicide right after a certain Marcus Antonius, you might know him as Mark Antony, also did. Antonius was rivals at the time with Octavian, who changed his name to Augustus, and as the adopted son of Julius Caesar, became the first emperor of the newly rebranded Roman Empire, this time with less democracy. Egypt's ascension into the Roman Empire turned out amazingly well for Rome, as Egypt, with its fertile Nile River, effectively became the breadbasket of Rome, and quickly the second wealthiest province in the empire, aside from Italia itself. It was kind of like the California of Rome. This relationship didn't end up all so good for the native Egyptians, however, as a rebellion actually took place in the year 139 AD in reaction to oppressive taxation under Antoninus Pius. In 270 AD, a woman by the name of Septimia Zenobia conquered Egypt for herself. Initially, she remained chill about it, but then Emperor Aurelian started some military campaigns that she didn't agree with, and so she decided to secede from Rome, and created the Palmyrene Empire. Claiming the imperial title in 271, which only lasted until Palmyra was besieged by Rome in 273, and she was exiled to Rome. This story is known in Syria as an important part of Syrian identity, and is probably known in the US as something you only just now found out about. After the Roman Empire broke, and the western half was lost and the trial period ran out, Egypt became a province of the Eastern Roman Empire, but only up until the year 619, when the Persian Sasanian Empire successfully conquered Egypt, before Shabaraz rebelled and made an alliance with Emperor Heraclius so that Rome could have Egypt back. Yeah, good luck with that, said Islam, conquering all of the Middle East and North Africa within its first few decades of existence. And this was the start of the history of Arab Egypt. Cairo was founded in 969 AD and became the seat of power during the Fatimid Caliphate, Ayyubid Dynasty, and the Mamluk Sultanate, because apparently we can't just agree on names. The Mamluk Sultanate was technically the first empire exclusive to Egypt in over 1300 years, a streak that then continued in 1517 when they were conquered by the Yarman Empire, and became the Ayala of Egypt, and Ayala was basically a state of the Ottoman Empire. Egypt again became the breadbasket of an empire whose name ended with Oman, whilst undergoing a bit of a case of deja vu. After Napoleon, insert Rosetta Stone here, Egypt was turned into the head of it of Egypt in 1867, which was a sort of a tribute state of the Ottoman Empire, and which came under British occupation in 1882. Egypt at this point was mostly ruled by the Albanian Egyptian Muhammad Ali dynasty, no relation, named after its founder Muhammad Ali Pasha, said to have been the founder of modern Egypt. The Suez Canal was finally opened in 1869 and made trade via the Indian Ocean a shorter venture which meant fewer opportunities for things like sea monster attacks. And today is more often used as it has no locks and can fit the largest cargo ships, unlike the Panama Canal. Sorry Teddy. Like the Panama Canal, though, it would cause quite a bit of a sovereignty issue later on, since Britain decided they basically owned it, even after Egypt's full independence. Then again, that was also kind of their attitude to the whole world, really. The 1888 Treaty of Constantinople declared a neutral zone under British protection in order to control rebellions. Take note of this, we're going to come back to it. In 1914, in the beginning of World War I, Egypt was officially made a protectorate of the British Empire, no longer part of the Ottoman Empire. However, Numerous nationalist uprisings prompted the British to eventually say, yeah, fuck this, and Egypt gained their full independence in 1922. However, this wasn't the Egypt that we quite see today, since they were still largely led by the Muhammad Ali dynasty, and there was still a significant British military presence in the area. Now that we're in the mid 20th century, this means, oh boy, I get to talk about King Farouk I, Egypt's kleptomaniac king. Named so largely because he would steal, like, a lot, even from foreign leaders and bodies at funerals. His full title was His Majesty Farouk I, by the grace of God, King of Egypt and the Sudan, Sovereign of Nubia, of Kordofan, and of Darfur. Apparently, he also stole all the names. In addition, he also banned everyone else in the country from owning red cars, so police officers would know immediately not to stop the guy in the red car speeding down the highways. In 1951, the 1936 Anglo-Egyptian Treaty, about that canal or whatever, was cancelled, and so the British forces in the area were now legally considered occupation. King Farouk I famously said, The whole world is in revolt. Soon there will be only five kings left. The King of English, the King of Spades, the King of Clubs, the King of Hearts, and the King of Diamonds. He said shortly before he was deposed in a military coup. 
The monarchy itself was also abolished a year later, after they realized that this meant his son and successor King Fuad II inherited the throne aged 6 months. After King Fuad II was deposed, Egypt got its first president, Mohammed Naguib, who was quickly forced to resign by the next guy, Gamal Abdel Nasser. One of the first things Nasser did was nationalizing the Suez Canal, which started the Suez Crisis, and was a fixture in the idea of Arab nationalism. In this spirit, Nasser also signed a deal with Syria, which formed the United Arab Republic in 1958, which promptly dissolved a few years later. Then the Six Day War happened, and Israel took the Sinai Peninsula and Nasser died in office, and was succeeded by Anwar Sadat. In the 60s, a new dam near Aswan formed Lake Nasser. Lake Nasser posed a significant threat to the temple at Abu Simbel, which was soon to be underwater unless something was done. So a painstaking effort was made to cut up the monuments piece by piece and move them higher up and further inland. They could also have probably just managed the water levels better, but okay, but do what you do. Sadat launched the October War in October 1973 as a surprise attack on Israel to take back the Sinai Peninsula and the Golan Heights. This scared the shit out of everyone, and the US and the USSR had to intervene. Eventually, Sadat made a historic visit to Israel in 1977, and a peace treaty was signed between the two in 1979. After Sadat was assassinated in 1981, he was succeeded by Hosni Mubarak, who led many infrastructure projects, like the Cairo Metro and the Cairo International Airport. But by 2011, he was still in power, and Egypt decided, yeah, like I need more of that. And then the Arab Spring happened. Yeah, no big deal, unless you were literally anyone in that area. Nowadays, Egypt is a powerhouse in the Arab world, often considered the Arab Hollywood, and at a population of 97 million, is by far the largest Arab country in the world. Egypt has been recently plagued by terrorism and internal struggles, but Egypt is still going as strong as they've ever been in the last 10,000 years, and frankly, Egypt is not going anywhere anytime soon. Thanks for watching part 2 of this series, and if you enjoyed it, be sure to give it a like, share, and subscribe to Warren Something New every Sunday. Also, follow my Twitter, at Kanubis, for new updates on what's going on here.